It was 1835, and it looked like war was on the horizon. A force of more than a thousand troops had arrived in disputed territory, occupying the largest town in the area, make it the center of their defense. The townspeople may have had their own opinions over who the land belonged to, but they knew that their future depended upon which army could defend their claim. Just to the south, another force had arrived to defend their position over who owned the disputed territory. The forces represented the state of Ohio, and the then territory of Michigan. And the land over which they were preparing to go to war was the then small town of Toledo. After decades of uncertainty, the state and the territory were now prepared to defend with force of arms their respective positions over where the border between them lay. What has become now called the Toledo War was at its climax and threatening to lead to bloodshed all over a nearly 50-year-old incorrect map. It is history that deserves to be remembered. The issues that would eventually cost the Toledo War have their origins in 1787, when the Congress of the Confederation passed the Northwest Ordinance, creating the Northwest Territory in the land northwest of the Ohio River. The eastern boundary of the territory was the Mississippi River, and its northern border was defined by British Canada and the Great Lakes. The act stipulated that this territory would eventually be divided into no less than three and no more than five states. The act also defined what the border between what would become Michigan and the states south of it would be, an east and west line drawn through the southerly bend or extreme of Lake Michigan. In 1800, the territory was split for the first time by a line that ran down the center of the lower Michigan Peninsula to the Ohio River. The eastern part was renamed the Territory of Ohio, while the western section was renamed Indiana Territory. The 1787 ordinance required 60,000 inhabitants for any part of the territory to apply for statehood, and the 1800 census counted 45,000 in the Ohio Territory. Anticipating that they would soon reach the 60,000, the inhabitants of Ohio began pushing for statehood. In 1802, Congress passed an Enabling Act, which established procedures for statehood and authorized the territory to hold a constitutional convention. The Enabling Act defined the northern boundary of Ohio as an east and west line drawn through the southerly extreme of Lake Michigan, running east until it shall intersect Lake Erie. It was this statement and the errors of the map on which it was based that would become the crux of disagreement. The Mitchell map, upon which the Ordinance of 1787 was based, was wrong about where the southern tip of Lake Michigan was, placing it significantly further north. Based on the Mitchell map and the text of the Enabling Act, the state of Ohio would have had control over the whole western shoreline of Lake Erie. But if the wording was used to draw a line from the actual tip of Lake Michigan, it would be much further south. During the convention, delegates had actually heard that the Mitchell map could be incorrect and sought to secure the control over as much of the Erie shoreline as possible, by including a provision that said that if the older map was incorrect, then Ohio's northern border would end at least as far as the most northerly cape of the Maumee Bay, which would include what became the city of Toledo. But Congress elected not to address the provision, and two years later, when they established the Territory of Michigan, they used the original wording from the 1787 Ordinance. Residents of the area that would become Toledo were aware that it was unclear exactly where the border lay, and they pressed Ohio to have the line surveyed. The Ohio legislature passed repeated resolutions pressing Congress to make a final determination for the state's northern border, which was to be done in 1812, just in time to be delayed by the War of 1812. It was only after the admission of Indiana in 1816 that a survey team was finally sent. The U.S. Surveyor General was Edward Tiffin, who had been the first governor of Ohio. He dispatched William Harris to survey the line as it was defined in the Ohio Constitution, which found the border to be north of the Maumee River. When the Harris line was made public, it infuriated Lewis Cass, governor of the Michigan Territory. President Monroe commissioned a new survey, this time based on the congressionally approved 1787 ordinance line. This survey found that the border should lie south of the Maumee River. This created a piece of land that became known as the Toledo Strip, although Toledo wouldn't become a city until 1833 when two towns merged and chose the new name. The Strip was five to eight miles wide and both Michigan and Ohio claimed it. Though Ohio refused to cede their claims, Michigan largely governed the area after 1818, building roads and collecting taxes in the area. But conflict was brewing. The Toledo Strip promised to be an important economic boon to whoever controlled it. Before trains, the best means of travel across the country was by water, enabled by the digging of canals. 
The completion of the Erie Canal in 1825 immediately turned Buffalo, New York into a boom town, making the city a hub of trade moving east from the Midwest. There were plans at the time to build a series of canals that would connect the Mississippi River to the Great Lakes, and Ohio hoped that the Maumee River and the western shores of Lake Erie would become an important stop on that journey. The land was also very fertile, providing excellent soil for crops that could be sent east. In 1830, President Andrew Jackson appointed John Mason Secretary of the Michigan Territory. John's son, 19-year-old Stevens Mason, was a natural politician and helped his father negotiate with anti-Jackson forces in the state. When John was sent on a mission to Mexico, Jackson named Stevens as his father's replacement. Lewis Cass was then named Jackson's Secretary of War, which made Stevens the acting territorial governor before he had turned 20. The new governor was often absent, and Stevens earned the nickname Boy Governor. Mason was an active supporter of Michigan statehood, and the state voted on October 1, 1832 to seek admittance to the Union. Congress was then supposed to pass an enabling act as it had for Ohio, but the Ohio delegation blocked it. Former President John Quincy Adams, then in Congress, sided with Michigan and wrote, Never in the course of my life have I known a controversy of which all the right was so clearly on one side and all the power so overwhelmingly on the other. Michigan could do little about it. Upset at being ignored, in 1834 the territory held a census that showed there were 86,000 people in Michigan, more than what was necessary to apply for statehood. The dispute over the Strip began to heat up. On February 12, 1835, at Mason's instigation, the Michigan Territorial Governor passed an act to prevent the organization of a foreign jurisdiction within the limits of the Territory of Michigan, or the Pain and Penalties Act, which criminalized any attempt for Ohioans to carry out governance in the Strip. This was in response to a plan by Ohio, which was passed 12 days later, that the Strip should be organized and that townships therein should hold elections in April. The act also enabled a remaking of the border along Ohio's claim. Mason immediately sent a letter to General Joseph Brown. You will perceive that a collision between Michigan and Ohio is inevitable and therefore will be prepared to meet the crisis. Brown and around a thousand militia were dispatched to Toledo. On March 31st, Ohio Governor Robert Lucas arrived in Perrysville, about 10 miles south of Toledo, with General John Bell and some 600 Ohio militia. Both sides were now prepared to defend their claim. Back in Congress, Ohio continued to refuse to allow any discussion of Michigan statehood until the boundary dispute was settled, in their own favor, of course. Michigan decided that they would proceed even without congressional approval and elected delegates for a constitutional convention. President Jackson was being pressured to get involved, but he didn't want to alienate the 21 Ohio members of Congress. His attorney general, though, sided with Michigan's interpretation. Jackson sent two representatives to find a compromise. They decided that Michigan should allow Ohio to resurvey the line and that the region should run itself until Congress came up with a solution. Ohio held local elections in the Strip three days later, and so Michigan refused to disband its militia. Thinking that things had cooled down, Ohio sent its survey team to mark their version of the border. On April 26, the survey party was resting in a field when a posse of Michiganders appeared to arrest them. According to the Ohio Party, while enjoying the blessings of the Sabbath, some 50 Michigan militia appeared to arrest them. Outnumbered and with only a few armed men, the nervous surveyors fled while under fire. Nine of our men, who did not leave the ground in time after being fired upon by the enemy, from 30 to 50 shots, were taken prisoners and carried away. Most of the nine would be released on bail. The Michiganders said that the Ohioans had drawn weapons first, and that the Michiganders had only fired a few shots in the air as a warning after the fleeing men. The encounter came to be named the Battle of Phillips Corners. Governor Lucas, infuriated, pushed through a number of laws in the Ohio legislature to make Toledo the seat of a newly named Lucas County, to form a court of appeals there, and to provide $300,000 to implement the legislation. Michigan immediately appropriated $315,000 to support their own militia. Michigan drafted a constitution during the summer and set up a functional state government that would first meet in November. Congress still refused to admit the state, and President Jackson vowed to reject admission until the dispute was resolved. A report that 10,000 able militia were available in Ohio became exaggerated as it went north, until Michigan promised to welcome the Ohio Million to hospitable graves. During the summer, the two sides arrested each other's partisans and generally brawled over the strip, spying on rival sheriffs and trying to govern the area. Michigan law officers sought to arrest Ohio supporter Major Benjamin Stickney in Toledo, which they did only after a major scuffle with his family. They had to physically tie the major to his horse to transport him to jail. 
Deputy Sheriff Joseph Wood attempted to arrest Stickney's younger son, who was named Two, brother of One Stickney. And in the ensuing fight, Two stabbed Wood with a penknife. Though only minorly injured, Wood was carried from the scene while the two fled into Ohio. Michigan charged Stickney with assault, but Governor Lucas would not send him to Michigan and argued that the crime was committed in Ohio and that Michigan had no authority to try to Stickney anyway. Trying to get things back under control, and thanks to the pressure of Ohio's congressman, Jackson removed Mason from his position as governor. But while his replacement was on the way, Mason ordered the Michigan militia to enter Toledo and arrest a number of Ohioans who were holding a symbolic court of appeals. By the time the militia arrived, they learned that the Ohio men had held court in the early hours of the morning and fled back across the Maumee River. Mason remained incredibly popular in Michigan, and despite his replacement arriving, the territory approved its constitution and elected Mason their first governor in October 1835. And for a time, Michigan was led by two governments. They sent two senators and a representative to Congress, but the men weren't allowed to take their seats. Though scuffles continue, Michigan couldn't afford to continue the standoff. The cost of maintaining the militia was quickly eating into what funds they had, and without support of the federal government, they had little ability to raise more. On June 15, 1836, Jackson signed a bill that would admit Michigan as a state, but only if it gave up its claim to the Toledo Strip. In exchange, Michigan would be given the 9,000 square miles of the western three-quarters of the Upper Peninsula. The easternmost quarter was already part of the territory. At the time, the Upper Peninsula was considered worthless, a land of perpetual snow that was destined by soil and climate to remain forever a wilderness. A special convention in Ann Arbor rejected the compromise. But desperation and opportunity have a way of changing opinions. A large surplus from the federal government was about to be distributed to the states, but not territories. A second convention was held in Ann Arbor in December, during a notable cold spell that passed a resolution to accept the congressional proposal. It isn't even clear if the convention was legal. The legislature had not called for one, and Michigan Whigs boycotted it. The cold and the controversy gave the meeting its name, the Frostbitten Convention. Despite questions of legality, Congress chose to recognize the resolution and officially grant Michigan its Upper Peninsula and statehood, while granting Ohio the coveted Toledo Strip. Michigan was made the 26th state on January 26, 1837. At first, Michiganders thought that they had lost the war, but that attitude changed in the 1840s with the discovery of iron and copper ore deposits in the Upper Peninsula. And those metals, as well as timber, earned fortunes for the state that at first thought that they had inherited only perpetual wilderness. Disagreements over the border actually continued into the 20th century, until a resurvey in 1915 was done that put the matter to rest. The state governors shook hands across the finalized border to symbolize the end of the conflict. Some Ohio counties still follow the Old State Line, and there exists near Toledo an Old State Line road that follows along some of the original line that had been claimed by Michigan. In 1973, a new dispute arose over where the state borders went through Lake Erie, and the Supreme Court eventually resolved the dispute in favor of the wording in the Ohio Constitution and split the uninhabited Turtle Island between the two states. Interestingly, the real loser of the Toledo War might not have been Michigan or Ohio, but Wisconsin, because absent the compromise that gave Michigan the Upper Peninsula, that land likely would have been part of Wisconsin when they eventually applied for statehood. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long, and if you did enjoy it, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section and I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.